Okay, this morning we're going to talk about uh, premillennial doctrine. Now, I've been accused numerous times from people of uh, being a premillennialist, and I've, I've referred to it in different messages, but I never actually made a message just on premillennial teaching. And, uh, I mean, I've had people tell me that I'm a heretic because I'm premillennial. I've had them tell me I'm deceived by Satan. I mean, I, there's some people out there that are very much against premillennial teaching. But I'm going to show you this morning that there, if you believe the King James Bible and you don't want to correct it with Greek and Hebrew, there's really no other way to interpret the clear scriptural passages in the Bible. And I'm going to show you that, in fact, the two other options, amillennial teaching and postmillennial, they are actually, they are the ones that are satanic. Okay? Now, just real quick, I just want to give you just a brief overview of what each one is. Amillennial is that there is no millennial kingdom. We're actually in it right now. Okay? All the, all the events of the book of Revelation happened in the first century with the fall of Jerusalem, and John was just writing poetically or something, and now we're in the millennial kingdom, quote-unquote. Now, that's ridiculous, and that's very popular among the Catholics, by the way. Um, the second one, post-millennial, is that Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the thousand-year kingdom, and the thousand-year kingdom of peace is set up by man. That doesn't take too much understanding of man and of human government to realize that that's ridiculous, too. The third option, which we're going to be talking about today, and I'm going to prove from the scripture, is premillennial which is Jesus Christ coming back at the beginning of the millennium and being here to run the thing. Okay? And I'm going to show you that that's the only possibility. So we're going to start out in Psalm 2, uh, verses 6 through 9. Now, if you want to read verses 1 through 5 sometime, that talks about this, this conspiracy, this conspiring of world leaders to bring about world dictatorship. Okay, that's been around since the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Even back beyond that, man always has a desire to consolidate power and to centralize power. You know, obviously, any kind of business that you get into, you know, uh, John D. Rockefeller said the one time that competition in business is a sin. You know, that's powerful, rich, powerful men seek to control things. Okay, and of course, Satan is at the top of that, and he's the one that seeks to control it. So you see what God thinks of it there in verses 1 through 5. But look at verse 6. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, who's that speaking about? This day have I begotten thee, thou art my son, yeah, Jesus. Jesus Christ. And what does God promise him? The heathen for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. God promised Jesus Christ physical rule here on the earth. Now, has Jesus Christ been given that physical rule yet? No. No, he hasn't. Okay, it's not, and, and you know, these people, these amillennial, postmillennial people have to spiritualize all these promises. Well, you know, spiritually, he is in control through his people, and no, he is the one that's going to be in control. And we'll see this, this as we continue. Turn over to uh, Psalm 47. <clears throat> psalm 47, we're going to read the whole psalm. It's only nine verses long. And this is going to be, uh, this psalm here is, is going to apply very well to the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth. It says here, O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose... Our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. Selah. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. 
For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Okay, now we're not going to get into this study, but the throne of David, the throne that was set up there with David as the king, you'll see that a lot of times it's it's kind of a type of the throne that Jesus Christ will rule and reign from. Okay, it's an earthly kingdom whose capital city is Jerusalem. Okay, this that's the kingdom, the holy hill of Mount Zion. All right, now turn to Isaiah chapter 2. And you're going to see, too, by the way, that one of the reasons that post-millennial and amillennial teaching are presented is because there are a lot of thieves out there that want to steal the promises that God made to Jesus Christ, first of all, and secondly, also to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people. God made specific promises and covenants with them, and the lost world wants to take those promises. They want to steal them from Jerusalem. And there's a lot of, you know, false doctrine there, which we aren't going to cover today. But it says here in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Not, you know, the white European races and the, you know, or the blacks or the, you know. No. Judah and Jerusalem. God's dealing with one race of people here. Verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Not his priests, not his pastors, not he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the people, I'm sorry, among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, the United Nations has the last half there of verse 4. They have that on their building. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Yeah, they have that thing on the front of their building. And it's, just, it's a joke because I have it written here. And this number, I'm sure, has changed. This is an old number. This is about late 90s, maybe early 2000. The number of wars sponsored by the United Nations is 157. 157 wars that the United States gave, or that United Nations gave their okay for. And they're talking about beating their swords into, into uh, plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Yeah, right. They're the ones that are killers. Okay? They're the ones, I mean, I can't get into the United Nations, but they're very bad, bad people. But the whole point is here, when does this peace come? When Jesus Christ comes back. And there are a lot of people that try to steal these promises and apply them to today. They don't apply to today. And they do not apply to the whites. They do not apply to the Orientals, to the, to the blacks, to the, they apply to the Jews. And to them only. That's the nation that God's going to choose. I have another message, um, on sermon audio there about, uh, there's a, a black guy, and I'm not, I'm not racist, so don't get excited, but there's a black guy up in, in Harlem, James Manning. And this guy teaches that Jesus Christ, of course, he's, he's a black man, and he's going to come back and set up his millennial kingdom, and the center's going to be in Harlem. <laughs> and the sons of Ham are actually the real, true, chosen people of God. Absolutely ridiculous. The guy's just a total heretic. I mean, just, I, he's not saved. There's no way. I mean, he's just, he has got some strange doctrine. But you see, there are so many groups that try to steal the promises that God gave to Jesus Christ, and then they, they also try to steal the promises God gave to the Jewish people. 
And they'll point to the Jewish people's sin and everything right now. Well, yeah, they're unbelieving right now. That's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble is to bring them back in line. Okay, Jesus Christ does not say that I'm, I'm going to give the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, to the to the Jewish people because they're wonderful and, and great or something. They're in sin right now. They've rejected Jesus Christ. Okay, they will be corrected for seven years, you know, and the Lord's going to preserve a remnant of them. And those people are going to go into the millennial kingdom and he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. If you don't like that? Well, sorry, that's why it's going to happen. But let's continue here. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 9. And here's another very familiar portion of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. It says here, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, I heard a message from a guy, from a brother, that, and he was talking about this passage, and he said, notice it does not say the zeal of God's people. It's the zeal of the Lord. Now, see, if you believe in anything but premillennial doctrine, then you believe that it's man that will perform this. It's not what the Bible says. It's the zeal of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the one that comes down and sets this thing up. And I'm going to show you that a little bit later, that man has been a consistent failure when it comes to human government. And there's no way that man could ever bring in a thousand years of peace. I mean, give me a break. Okay, now turn to Micah, one of the minor prophets. We're going to go back there to Micah. Micah, Micah chapter 4. I went past it. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And you're going to notice this thing again, like we saw there, uh, just one of the previous passages we read where it says about in the last days. This isn't Jesus Christ's first coming. It's in the last days. Uh, verse 1, or, uh, it says here, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many na nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Very similar there to the passage in Isaiah. Verse 3, And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has, hath spoken it. This has not happened yet. Okay, I, I don't know how people can get confused about that. I mean, you know, uh, where is it here? Verse 4, um, They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Do you think the Jews live in fear right now? Over there in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. You better believe it. There's war all the time over there. I mean, you see pictures of some of the areas, you know, down there, what is it, Gaza or whatever. There's bullet holes in the walls, you know. And, I mean, they, they show video and stuff. You can hear the mortar going off and boom, boom, boom in the background. I mean, it's just continual fighting. Oh, this scripture's fulfilled. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It will be, but it isn't right now. And anybody that teaches you right now that you should beat your uh, swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks, <laughs> look out for that. You don't want to be disarmed right now. Okay, now we're going to go next to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 8 is where we'll start out. <clears throat> Zechariah 8 verses 1 through 3. 
says here, Again the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation of the truth, absolute truth. When he goes there to Jerusalem, it will be called a city of truth. It's not a city of truth right now. It will be. You know. Go to chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Here again, we're going to see some definite proof that this that the Bible teaches premillennial doctrine. Okay, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's going to be the end of the tribulation. Verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is not the first coming. This is after he was crucified, the second coming. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They're going to realize we rejected Jesus Christ. We rejected our, our Savior, and here he is. You know, And they're going to look on him, look on him. Notice it says that, look on him, physically see him. There's no way that you can spiritualize this thing unless you have a motive, which is why they do it. All right, now look over at Zechariah chapter 14, verses 8 through 9. Okay, you have verses 1 down through about uh, verse 7. It talks about this um, war there at the end of the tribulation. And then the kingdom is set up here. Verse 8, it says, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in, in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. King of kings and Lord of lords. We'll see that a little bit later. Look down at verse 16. It says here, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Let me make a point real quick. Do you have to go to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ right now? No. There are a lot of people, I, I, I've gotten in some arguments with some, some of the brethren, and they, they, they take the gospel that we have now, and they say that's the eternal gospel. It'll always be that way. Uh, no, it won't. And actually, next week, we're going to talk about the gospel of salvation for the tribulation. Okay? And, you know, I'm going to be real careful with what I'm saying. But the point is, right now, you can worship the Lord anywhere. Not in the millennial kingdom. It's not going to work. Why? Because he's physically present. Okay? And all the nations are going to have to come up and it's kind of funny because there's so many people that, that hate Jerusalem and Zionism and all this stuff like that. Well, guess what? If those lost people make it through the tribulation, that's a big if. But if they do, they're going to have to go up physically to Jerusalem every year and worship the Lord. <laughs> it's going to be real tough for some of those people. But uh, it says here, and it says, too, in the last part of verse 17 there, that there shall be no rain if they don't. So they're going to be forced to. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. 
In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots of the, in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. You can study who the Canaanites are. not going to make any more comments on that. <laughs> Now we're going to go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to look at what happened here in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is a very interesting book because it's, it's the one that deals <clears throat> specifically, it's, in fact, I think it's the only book in the New Testament that deals specifically with the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to see about this, what is this, this thing of the kingdom of heaven? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. <coughs> it says here, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Why was he preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven? <clears throat> because the king was there. Turn over to chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Okay, now what happens here is uh, John the Baptist is basically imprisoned. And it says here, verse 12, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth he came came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There you see the kingdom of heaven again. Now, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, you have the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> and again, I've dealt with this in other messages, the unscriptural pacifism message, where a lot of people try to take the Sermon on the Mount and say it's Christian doctrine. They try to take it again. This temptation is there for world peace. And they try to they try to steal it out of the context, out of the millennial kingdom, when Jesus Christ is physically present. They try to steal it and say, we can do it today without Jesus Christ physically present. You can't do it. It's impossible. But look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There again you see it. Uh, jump down to verse 19. And we're not going to read it, but it says the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven appears two times there. And finally in uh, verse 20, you see the kingdom of heaven again. Now look over at uh, verse 34 in Matthew chapter 5 there. It says here, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem the city of the great king today? No. It will be. Okay? The reservation, if you will, has been made. It's going to happen. It's written in this book right here. Prophecy is pre-recorded history. It will happen. Jesus Christ will rule from Jerusalem. But he isn't right now. So if you want to take this and say this is for today, then Jesus Christ would have to be in Jerusalem. It would have to be the city of the great king. Okay? It's not. It doesn't work. And there, you know, and you can get into Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and you, there's no mention of the blood of Jesus Christ in there. There's no mention of the gospel of salvation that we have. Jesus Christ is physically walking around. He hasn't died on the cross yet. Doctrinally, you're in the Old Testament. There's just so many problems with the Sermon on the Mount being applied to today. You know, it just doesn't work. But uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 10. 
Matthew chapter 10. You know, these people that say that I don't believe in, you know, I've seen people, I am not a dispensationalist. We are non-dispensational. Okay, I'd like you to please explain this uh, scripture right here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do you explain that if you're not dispensational? And I read something interesting here recently. Some guy said, to those of you who are non-dispensational, when was the last time you brought a lamb to church on Sunday morning? <laughs> uh, yes, you are dispensational. Every Christian out there is dispensational. They just don't like to admit it. you know. But right there, how do you explain that? How do you reconcile this with church-age doctrine? How do you reconcile it with Paul saying, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles? Well, he's disobeying Jesus Christ. See, if you're non-dispensational, that's what you have to hit. And, of course, I covered that in the, in the other message, so I'm not going to say anything more about that. But what is the kingdom of heaven? Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 11 through 12. It says here, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now look at verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now you pick up the average commentary and you look it up, they will say the kingdom of heaven is where God is right now. Heaven. That's all they, they see heaven and they say, well, that's, you know, God, that's his realm. Really? The violent take it by force? That's not where God is, okay? The kingdom of heaven is the physical, earthly kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital city. And you study down through history, up until 1945, that kingdom was taken by force. And guess what happened in 1945? It was taken by force again. <laughs> okay? The Jews, they fought. They won it. Okay? It's taken by force. Okay? And what's the Antichrist going to do? He's going to go against Jerusalem. And he's going to take Jerusalem, and he's going to be coming after the Jews to wipe them out entirely, permanently. The Antichrist, of course, being the man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan manifest in the flesh essentially towards the end of the tribulation there and he is going to try to wipe out the Jews completely and Jesus Christ is going to stop him from doing it and he's going to come down as a conqueror you say well Jesus you know I, our message on unscriptural pacifism with the charity ministries guy they were they were saying about how that I can't imagine Jesus Christ as a conquering you know warrior and, and killing people and stuff well we're going to get into that a little bit later Jesus Christ is physically going to take the kingdom by force. Okay? He's going to use violence. And we're going to see that in just a little bit here. And of course you say, well that's that's horrible. I can't it's going to be true and righteous. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look at verse 30 through 31. This is this passage here, these two verses talk about after the time of Jacob's trouble, this great tribulation time period, this is what's going to happen. Okay, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. I've gone over Matthew 24 in great detail. I actually have a whole message on Matthew 24, so you can listen to that for more detail. But you have Jesus Christ coming back, sending his angels to gather the elect. Look at verse 31 here. I'm sorry, no. Yeah, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, 
Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Enter the kingdom. And he's physically on the earth with all the nations gathered before him. Okay? Now at the very least, you could argue, well, maybe this is after the tribula or after the thousand year kingdom, which wouldn't make any sense. But amillennialism, that there is no millennium? No way. It doesn't work. Jesus Christ was never physically on the earth and never judged the nations. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense how you could believe that. Unless, of course, you're one of the nations that's going to be judged and put on the left hand if you're a goat. Okay, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I've been wanting to get here more and more. The more things go, this Revelation 19 and 20 are two of my favorite chapters <laughs> because I know how it's going to end up. You see the wickedness and the corruption of human government, and it's frustrating. You know, you, well, if, if we could just vote these people out, if we could Im imprison the criminals, if it, it's not going to happen. What's going to happen? Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. People in heaven before the end of the tribulation? Absolutely. Saying, Amen, or I'm sorry, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now we've been over that in the other uh, another message there, uh, Mystery Babylon, who is, who is this in Revelation 17 and 18. And it is the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they're the ones that killed the, the blood of his servants. Okay, but let's continue on here. Verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. And as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Who is the bride of Jesus Christ? The church. And again, I've covered that in other messages. It's too big, I can't cover it here. Okay, his the his bride is the church of Jesus Christ. Now you you know you understand what the Bible says about marriage, these two shall be one flesh. That's how we can be the, the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. Okay. What are we doing in heaven, by the way, if there's a post tribulation rapture? It's pre tribulation. And again I cover that in other messages. But now look at verse eleven. Okay, this is towards the end of the tribulation, if you study the Bible. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You don't have to worry about any innocent people being slaughtered down here by Jesus Christ. By the end of the tribulation, these people are going to be just <laughs> horrible. Jesus Christ will judge in righteousness. Okay, it's not cruel, it's not horrible, he's judging in righteousness. Verse 12, 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So you see there, verses 11 through 13, very clearly, obviously, talking about Jesus Christ preparing for battle. And guess what? Verse 14, we prepare for battle. We get married, and then we go to war. (laughs) Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Do you remember how we started out this message? Psalm chapter 2. God promised his son that he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Right there it's being fulfilled. Now if Jesus Christ doesn't physically rule the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, then God lied to him. See, God promised him a millennial rule. I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. You will rule all nations. How could you be anything but premillennial? I just don't understand that. You know, and 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 to call it heretical to be premillennial. I mean, it, it just amazes me. How could you be postmillennial? How could you believe that man brings in this thousand-year kingdom? I just, I, I don't understand. You you know, I mean, you people that write. You know, and, and I'm sure that there are going to be some that write about this and try to weasel out of it some way. Man, you need to repent. I mean, it. And Brian, it just, these aren't just new Christians. These are people who've been saved for oh, a yeah. while that believe yeah. this stuff. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of people that have been saved for a long time. And you know something else I just want to say? Almost across the board, I've seen that Calvinists are post millennial. I've seen it time and time and time again. Most Calvinists, they're post millennial. You know? I don't get it. <laughs> Just how, how can you get that from Scripture? But anyhow, let's continue here. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Not against man, against Jesus Christ. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Let me stop there for just a second. Remember what happened in Revelation chapter 13 when the Antichrist is wounded in the head? What do the people say? Who is like unto him? Who is able to make war with him? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is able to make war with him. And before he attacks... He takes the Antichrist and the false prophet and chucks them into the lake of fire in front of their army. He answers the question. Verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. In righteousness, Jesus Christ is 100% right in what he did. And you see the wickedness of man right now, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. You can see the Antichrist army being formed. The youth of today that are going to be the adults at that point in time, they have very, very little morals. They just think it's funny to mock the Bible. I saw a video recently of some guys out street preaching, and they were doing a good job of preaching. They were preaching the Word of God. And there were youth sitting around making fun of hell, laughing about it. Those youth are going to be adults in another couple of years. Ten years down the road, they're going to be adults. Who's going to be making up the Antichrist army? 
You know, I'm not giving a date for the rapture, but I'll tell you, it's getting close. Okay? Just incredible. All right, now we're going to hit Revelation 20. And, you know, this whole study, it's been it's been pretty detailed. And there's a lot more scripture, by the way, I could go to to prove the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. But all you really need to know is Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 proves conclusively that Jesus Christ is here for the thousand-year kingdom. I mean, you really don't need anything more than Revelation 20. And I actually had a guy, a, a Calvinist, a post-millennial Calvinist, uh, write to me a little bit. I was back and forth with him a little. This was a while back. And he and he, I said, about what about Revelation 20? Well, you know, that is kind of a problem. You know, there, you know, there are some problems there, and I don't know if we should be taking how much of that literal. And they can't deal with Revelation 20 because it's it's crystal clear. So let's continue here. Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Very interesting that even after a thousand years of Jesus Christ physically on the earth and Satan bound, people still rebel at the end. Pretty incredible. This shows you the wickedness of the flesh. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned by themselves a thousand years. It says, with Christ. I'm being sarcastic. They lived and reigned with Christ. You say, well, that yes, that means that they had Christ in them. And, you know. But wait a second. Chapter 19, Jesus Christ comes down. Where does it say that he went back up? It doesn't. And before I forget, I just want to read something here real quick. I actually cut this thing out from this article because I thought it was so good. Um, I'm not going to go over all the different uh, dates here. But I have all of the world's great kingdoms here in the back of my Bible. The Assyrian Empire, the Persian, the Greek, the Roman Republic, the Roman Empire, the Arab Empire, the Marmaluke Empire, the Ottoman Empire, Spain, uh, Romanov, Russia, Great Britain, the USA, and there's others. But the average life span, so to speak, is about 200 to 250 years. And then they fall. How are you going to make it a thousand years? There's never been one kingdom that has lasted more than 300 years on this earth. How are you going to make it a thousand years? Are we better now than we were in the past? Hardly. It just it's it is unscriptural to be post-millennial and especially amillennial and it's not even scientific. I mean, show me one kingdom on this earth that ever made it a thousand years. It's impossible. Not going to happen. Okay, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And we're going to talk about this. That's going to be how we're going to finish it. But I'll continue here. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Beloved city? What is it? The Sermon on the Mount. The city of the great king, Jerusalem. That's the beloved city. You can't spiritualize it. It's physical. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. That's a real good one to use on Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. 
Okay, the lake of fire is real. They get cast in over there in verse 20 of chapter 19, and they're still there in chapter 20, verse 10. So they didn't, still get, there. They didn't get annihilated? Yeah, they didn't get annihilated. Imagine that. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Man, you better get saved. If you're not saved, if you're listening to this message, you are going to be in serious trouble. You say, I'm a good person. Well, that's what you're going to be judged by. Isn't that something? The average lost person actually believes that it's their works that they'll be judged by one day. And they're right. They will be judged according to their works, according to what this book says. You have the Word of God. You have God's standard. The words that I have spoken unto you, the same shall judge him in the last day. Right there. God has not left us without a witness. But verse 6 said that we would reign with Christ, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, we've talked a lot about doctrine this morning, but I want to make some application. I want to give a little challenge. Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've been dealing a lot with uh, millennial doctrine, with millennial kingdom passages. But now I want to kick you Christians out there, and I'm going to kick myself real good with this, because I need to be kicked. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 11 says there that we would about millennial inheritance, millennial reign. It says here in verse 11, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. What is Jesus Christ going to deny? He's going to deny our inheritance there in the millennium. If you don't suffer for Jesus Christ in this, on this earth, and that's not a Catholic thing where you flagellate yourself, you beat yourself over the back with a whip or something. It's talking about living for the Lord. Let me tell you something. You don't have to go out and look for suffering. You don't have to physically make yourself suffer. All you need to do is stand for the King James Bible and witness to people and stand for biblical truth. You will suffer. <laughs> It's par for the course. It comes along with it. And I'll tell you, you are not alone. Okay? I talk to, to people, I have contact with people all over the earth now. I mean, Canada, Australia, the UK, the Faroe Islands. I mean, most people don't even know where that's at. I didn't at first. You know, people all over the world, and it's the same story. Well, I'm a King James Bible believer, but and my parents think I'm crazy. My pastor thinks I'm crazy. I can't find a good church. We got I got kicked out of the church here. All the people at work think I'm nuts. I'm the only two. We're the only two people. My husband and wife, you know, or you know, or the husband and wife there, are the only two people in the entire area. Same thing, suffering. And how many people have left the King James Bible and King James Bible belief simply because they wanted to find a church family that they could be part of? And now they're going to a church whose emphasis is on entertainment and on feeling good and on not suffering. Think about that. What are those people doing? What are those preachers doing? They're taking away your millennial inheritance. They're making it so church... We Just a mega big church. What was it? The one down there in Worship Center, worship center thing. What, what did they say they spent on that? $18 million or something like that? $18 million building, and they said, the pastor said, we want to make church fun. That's what he said. What's he doing? He's stealing millennial inheritance from people. He's not teaching them how to suffer. He's teaching them how to get along with people. 
how to how to how to water down the gospel of Jesus Christ so it's not offensive. It's disgusting. But let's do two more verses here and then we're done. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Don't get messed up in, in all kinds of doctrinal things. Remember the simplicity of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's, you can go off in the wrong direction. It's simple. Okay, salvation is a simple thing. Don't overcomplicate it. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is one of your most important responsibilities as a Christian. The main... You see, people say, why are there so many denominations? Because they disobey verse 15. They do not rightly divide the word of truth. And if somebody is telling you that the millennial kingdom that Matt, or that the Sermon on the Mount is for today, they are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? If somebody's telling you that Jesus Christ is not coming back at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, they are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Period. They are not studying. And they are a workman that needs to be ashamed. Okay? Suffer for Jesus Christ if you're a Christian. Stand for truth. The suffering will come. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> study God's word. Stay in the book. Learn to rightly divide it. Those are your three main responsibilities. You know, there's an old statement. I'm just going to say this in closing. Uh, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I've always hated that statement because it should be the exact dif the exact opposite. Don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. You know, when you think about it, even just the millennial kingdom, 1,000 years compared to our life here, and your rewards are going to be based on this little tiny little life that we have here, and we don't even have that much more to go before the Lord comes. It's getting real close. There's not much time left. So get out there and do something for the Lord. Uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.